Hi, my name is Manish Raghavan, and today I'll be talking to you a bit about uh, AI and employment discrimination. So many of you may have seen stories like the ones here, stories about how AI is increasingly being used in hiring, how it might potentially be a force for good, but at the very least, it's shaping the way that, uh, the way that we hire in practice. Now, you may have also seen examples like the one here, uh, examples of software or AI that purports to analyze video interviews and recognize people's emotions, look at the tone and cadence of their speech, perhaps their language patterns, their choice of words, and use that to form an evaluation of how good an employee they'll be. And finally, you may have also seen headlines like the ones here, headlines that talk about how AI and hiring might actually be bringing bias to the table, how it might be replicating human biases, and how we should work hard to try to make uh, AI more fair. And my goal today will be to try to disentangle all of these narratives and help you sort out uh, what it would really mean to use AI in hiring or what it currently does mean to use AI in hiring uh, and how people are trying to think about and mitigate issues of bias and discrimination. So that's going to be our plan today. We're going to start by looking at uh, why we should expect to see bias, uh, where this bias comes from and how it might propagate to algorithms. We'll next take a look at how AI is being used in the context of hiring. Uh, and we'll take a look as well at what steps people are taking to try to mitigate uh, its effects in terms of bias and discrimination. Uh, and finally, we'll take a quick look at what the regulatory landscape looks like, how regulation might be changing going forward, and, and what those changes might mean uh, for AI and for hiring, and particularly for questions of discrimination. So let's begin by taking a look at why we should expect to see bias uh, in the context of hiring. Now, perhaps the most uh, obvious example I can give you, or the cleanest example I can give you, is from a study by Marianne Bertrand and Sandel Molinathan almost 20 years ago, where they simply took the same resume and put different names at the top and sent it out to a bunch of different employers. Uh, and then they just observed who actually called them back in response to this resume. What they found, which many of you may be familiar with by now, is that uh, resumes that had African-American sounding names got significantly lower callback rates than those with white sounding names. They found similar disparities with respect to gender as well. And a meta study uh, more, more than 10 years later showed that little had changed in those years. Now, why am I telling you this story about human biases in decision making? What does this have to do with AI? Uh, well, the problem here is data is the foundation of uh, AI and data driven decision making. So to the extent that that data is biased, when that data comes from biased human choices, we should expect to see those same biases reflected in algorithmic decision-making or in AI. Okay, so with that in mind, let's now turn to how people are actually using AI today and what steps they're taking uh, to mitigate issues of bias and discrimination. So at a quick look, we actually see that AI is used everywhere in the hiring uh, process. Now, the image on the right of the slide is taken from a report by Miranda Bogan and Aaron Rieke a few years ago, where they detailed the various uh, places, layers in the hiring funnel, as they call it, where people are using algorithmic decision-making or AI. Now, these layers include things like sourcing, which is where an, how an employer uh, gets different applicants to apply to their job opening, uh, to screening, which is how an employer decides who to interview of those applicants, to the interviewing process itself, and finally to selection, background checks and making offers and so forth. Now, there are a lot of different uses of AI uh, throughout this funnel, as I said. Today, I'll be focusing on three particular uses and, and we'll walk through them together. So the, we'll, we'll be considering advertising, search, and assessments. Let's begin with advertising. So your traditional conception of job ads, uh, job advertising, might be something like an employer puts an ad in a local newspaper, People apply, maybe calling the phone number or faxing in their resumes. Uh, but of course, that's not how job advertising works today. Now, in general, advertising is everywhere, especially all over the internet. And this has actually afforded a lot of new possibilities for employers to get their job postings out there. Uh, now, there are two features of online advertising that I think are particularly salient, particularly when it comes to questions of discrimination. Uh, and we'll walk through them here. So these are targeting, 
which is uh, how an employer can determine who they want their job ad to go to. Perhaps they select certain characteristics, a uh, person with certain interests and so on. Uh, and in addition to targeting, we have optimization, which is how this larger, broader algorithmic uh, advertising ecosystem uh, determines allocations and outcomes, right? So who ultimately sees what ad? Uh, it has to do with competitive market forces. It has to do with optimization and targeting and all of these things put together uh, that turn into some emergent results, which are actually quite hard to characterize. Um, now, the case that I think is quite relevant to consider here is the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, versus Facebook, which was settled a few years ago. Uh, essentially, the, the Department of Housing and Ur Urban Development alleged that Facebook had allowed for discriminatory advertising practices. Uh, and as part of the settlement, Facebook was required to remove certain options from that targeting. So uh, things like targeting ads for jobs based on demographic attributes, uh, that option had to be removed from Facebook. What this didn't address, though, is questions of optimization. Uh, for instance, suppose that it costs more to advertise to one demographic group than another, just on average. Uh, we should expect to see uh, the way that these current systems are set up. We should expect to see fewer job ads going to that group simply because they cost more to advertise to. Now, is this discrimination and who is responsible? These are hard questions and we don't have answers yet. But these are this is part of the conversation uh, that's going on today and hopefully we'll have better answers in the coming years. The next uh, example I'll give you is of search. And this is the process by which uh, a recruiter might reach out to applicants who seem qualified for the job. Now, this takes place largely on platforms like LinkedIn, Monster, and CareerBuilder, and so on today. So for instance, if I search for a product manager in the San Francisco Bay Area on LinkedIn, I might get a, a set of results that looks like this. But of course, there's no reason that LinkedIn had to show me these four particular people. They could have shown me a, a totally different set of other people. Uh, so exactly how does LinkedIn make that determination? As with many of the applications we're talking about here, it is data driven uh, and there's some AI or algorithm on the back end that is making this decision uh, for them. And of course, that data that it's based on, perhaps who, uh, who recruiters have interacted with in the past, who they've reached out to uh, as a signal of, of quality, can also be biased because we believe uh, recruiters' decisions, and, and we have evidence to believe that recruiters' decisions uh, can be biased. And so in an attempt to mitigate this bias or prevent that bias from, from creeping into its algorithmic decisions, LinkedIn actually made an affirmative choice in 2018 to gender balance the search results uh, that they return. So uh, when you search for a, a particular you know, job role that you're looking to fill, you will get results that are re uh, reflective demo uh, in terms of gender of the overall US for that job type. Now, they didn't have to make this change. It was a, a step that they decided to take. It is also not the only thing they could do. For instance, they haven't, uh, they're unable to really take any action with respect to things like race, uh, largely because it's, they don't really have that data in general. But the point being, uh, algorithmically, there are many steps that we can take to try to mitigate bias, and it has to start with a recognition that those biases exist in the first place, and that the, the biases uh, of human recruiters can propagate if unchecked into the algorithms that we then build on top of them. The final example I'll give you uh, is of assessment. And so this is how employers decide which of their applicants they actually want to interview. Now, many of the algorithms used in this space are what we might call resume screening algorithms, where they take in someone's resume and they determine whether they pass the filter or not. But more and more, we're starting to see these more complex applications uh, where algorithms are taking in things like video interviews, uh, as the one that I showed you earlier, or perhaps people's gameplay or a questionnaire. And these uh, pieces of, of input are then algorithmically evaluated to determine who might be best suited for a job. And they, you know, this example that I've given you, on, uh, I've shown on the right here, uh, speaks to a numeric uh, evaluation in terms of different traits or competencies, for example. Now, again, where do these evaluations come from? How do they know who's a good employee or not? All this is based on data and, and based on human judgments and decisions. And if, as is becoming the theme here, we might expect that to the extent that they are built on human choices, uh, they might reflect bias and discrimination that humans bake in. And so in response, a lot of the vendors in the space are trying to actively de-bias their algorithms. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one common technique uh, that I've seen used in practice, and it's the following. Uh, an employer will, or a vendor of a tool will build a model, build some AI system, but before they actually deploy it, 
they'll, they'll test it. They'll see, does this create significant outcome disparities? Does it you know, treat, uh, appear to have different outcomes for, for men and women or people of different races? Uh, and if it does, they'll actually go back into the model and try to tweak it, remove the things that seem to be contributing to those disparities, uh, and iteratively repeat this process until they reach a model that they're satisfied with. Now, this isn't the only technique that you could use here, but it is one example of how people are trying to actively mitigate the amount of bias and discrimination uh, that creeps into the tools that they're building. Now, the final thing I'll, I'll turn to before we go is uh, the question of regulation, because uh, traditionally, discrimination law has been the thing that protected us from biased uh, and discriminatory dis decision making. Uh, but of course, discrimination law is imperfect and it's not necessarily well suited to apply to algorithmic tools. So what might regulation look like in the future and, and what uh, solutions or regulatory approaches have people proposed? Uh, I'll give you three examples here uh, with the caveat that these are not the only three examples in this space. Now, the first is informed consent, uh, and we've seen this in Illinois with a, a, a law that they passed uh, requiring uh, notice and consent for using video analysis uh, in, in interviews. Now, the notice and consent model is nice in that, you know, we'd like to be informed, we'd like to know what is being done with our data. But at the same time, it does put the burden uh, on the applicants themselves, and it doesn't really address these root causes of bias and discrimination that we see. Uh, the second approach that I've seen is one of safe harbors, where regulators will try to define a set of best practices, and as long as employers adhere to these best practices, uh, they will have some, they'll be shielded from liability to some extent. Uh, the, the benefit here is that it encourages people to adopt these best practices, but of course there's a downside that we don't quite know exactly what these best practices are yet. Right? We're still learning, and, and this field is still young. Uh, but hopefully as we go, we'll be better positioned to set up these types of safe harbors where people can experiment and try to uh, use new techniques to mitigate bias um, with, within the confines of the law. The final approach that I'll mention to you is mandatory auditing. And, and this was recently implemented in a bill that, the, that New York City passed last year, um, where they require that, uh, that algorithms used in the context of hiring be audited for the, uh, for the purposes of discrimination uh, every year. And now this, of course, it sounds, it sounds nice. We would like to know be, before these tools are even deployed whether they might produce discriminatory outcomes. Uh, but of course, auditing is quite hard. It's, it's hard to standardize exactly what should go into an audit. Uh, and this makes it difficult to, to ensure that it's not set up in a way that is uh, favorable to the employers in general. So these are the few of the regulatory approaches that I've seen. Of course, there will be many more as we go, but I find it interesting to follow this space as a microcosm for what regulation might look like more broadly uh, in the context of AI. Thanks for your time. I hope you learned something useful from this and please feel free to reach out if you have any further questions.